don't even think about anything practical like how you would do it or if it was even possible. Just consider what you like or really what you love because this is how a series starts. And I know that you guys already have a bunch of wonderful images that you may want to build upon or add to, but tonight it's about the decisions that we make when we're out in the moment with our cameras. Um, you know, I think that we see so many images each day that we rarely have time to indulge our own mental landscape and that's what tonight is about. So one way to tune into the creative spirit in nature is to start with an idea, even before you step out into the world with your camera. Know your favorite subjects. Um, decide what you're going to choose and how you're going to really trick your camera into seeing the way that you want it to see. One of the, I started out shooting color 35 millimeter slide film, but I quickly found that when I wanted to create a series, one of the best ways to do that, especially a nature series was with, um, with black and white. And this series had to be black and white to show off the shapes. My artist statement is very short and simple. It says, the intent of this series is to show the shape and geometry of natural forms and the way they grow and unfurl. This is best illustrated through the black and white photographic process as the contrasts show us the perfection of these living forms. And if you really look at these images, they're very different. There's some, some birds and fish and different things in there. So it's not just a unified series of subjects, um, but the, the subject matter is still unified by the tonality and by the format. And when I say format, I mean the shape of the size of the image, the dimension of the images. And I feel like if you're looking at a, a finished portfolio, you know, somebody's showing their formal portfolio of their, the work that they really care about, um, it shouldn't jump from color to black and white or sepia. And it should not have a mixture of tonalities because um, it jars us. When you see a color image and then you see a black and white and then a sepia, um, each, each switch, um, our brain is ha having to switch gears. We're, we're not able to um, really dive deeply into the body of work uh, if we don't pick a tonality. So. When you allow yourself to work in a unified theme, you get to decide what you like. And it's not what anybody else has done. It's your own idea. You get to pick your own tonalities and to match them to your chosen subject matter. So um, again, tonight, this is about you thinking to yourself, what, what is my personal preference? And as I started out early in my career, I discovered something, that if a gallery or a client liked an image, they would always ask me, hey, do you have any more of these? And if I didn't, and if I tried to go back and shoot more, it was difficult. It was um, impossible because the time of the year, the season would be wrong, the light would be too hard, and under a short deadline, I just couldn't do it. So I quickly learned to start working in a series and that really helped me. This project was an installation of these big silk, this is probably one of the first big installations that I did, but they were semi-transparent silk curtains and the models could walk in front of them and behind them so you could still see them moving. And it was interesting, they picked some that were farther back and some that were closer up and then the very back, um, and you could still see the people kind of going behind them, but um, there were three of this unified series within a series because um, I shot these on a, um, a um, light table. That's why they're so flat 
and organized. I actually did design these. Some of the other ones in the series, if you go back, um, were outside. So if, um, you know, if you can't get out, can't go outside, I don't think it's wrong to take natural forms and bring them into the studio. You know, if you wanna design um, pieces that really let you get closer. Also, um, I'm gonna talk about macro photography later on, but a lot of times when you're outside and things are moving around, if you can't control your design, um, I certainly don't think that it's, um, you know, cheating or anything to, to, um, to bring it in, if that's what you're into. So again, um, the nature, this nature series, um, I continue to work on this to this day and I will continue to work on it, you know, into the future forever because it's, um, it's really endless. When I see this kind of this kind of light or this kind of form, I'm thinking, okay, I can I can get another one for for my series. Um, being fully in the moment means seeing your full image area. So as you shoot, design within the shape that you choose up front. If you need things closer, then get closer. If you need things farther back, then just back up, but make those compositional decisions right then. And um, I don't like to rely on after cropping. Um, it never improves my composition. I mean, for me, it just, it never works out. It works much better if I do it in the moment. So compose your frame and camera. Don't ignore this harmonic area that you've been given. This is the two to three ratio of um, 35 millimeter film. So I'm always thankful that when 35 millimeter film was invented, that it was the two to three, that it was not four by five. And I went through a whole four by five camera phase um, and I struggled to shoot with it, not just because it was slow and bulky and, and took a lot, of, um, a lot of time, but my compositions felt static to me. And uh, I personally think that it was that format. When you use the two to three ratio, there's something really cool that happens. And I promise you that if you compose in camera and you just start getting your subjects closer to the edge and you get some tension with lines and shapes to the edge, um, these dynamic relationships will just start to form naturally. So when I'm composing in camera, I'm not really thinking about, oh, is this going right down to the corner? And is this, I just try to get it close to the edge and then these things just naturally start to happen. The other perfect geometric proportion is the square. Um, and if you choose to have a square format, make sure that it is a true square. Don't just eyeball it and say, okay, this kind of looks square. Use your square tool and just make it a perfect square because that's really important. And any permutation of the square is just naturally cool. Um, you know, you can hook as many as you want together and it's gonna, it's still gonna have that harmonic power. I think that um, just the choice of your format alone plays a big part in the success of your image and also of your entire series. Avoid the pitfalls of after cropping your image, design in camera, using all of your given image area. So just don't do it. I mean, if, if you need to crop off a little bit or rotate it a little bit and all that, that's fine. Um, just don't give away that precious area inside that frame. You know, trust your frame and your innate sense of geometric balance will kick in. And that's when it's fun, when you're in the moment and you're using that. Um, I think if you try to rationalize it, um, it doesn't work either. Just naturally using your format is gonna, is gonna make you make really, really strong 
composition. So edge to edge, corner to corner, that's when our images get stronger and stronger. I'm going to show you an example of the heartaches of after cropping and why we avoid it. Um, I'm friends with the former student who's a, a wonderful nature photographer, Cynthia Bond. Um, she's a really great bird photographer now, but way back when she was starting out, um, she found this exercise to be very, very profound and um, key in how she now sees and composes her bird images. But this was a long time ago back at our Delaware workshop and she was presenting these flower images where she was, I later figured out she was just cropping out parts of it with the flower right in the middle. Um, sort of like she was collecting, um, you know, different types of flowers. But I didn't realize that at the time, um, why her images had this weird kind of odd pixelation. They were all, um, the images were all different shapes and sizes and there was this weird pixelation. And then I saw this um, screenshot of her full frame. This was the full shot. This was the two to three ratio real image before she had cut out just that little central part. So, um, you know, here she's getting all these great shapes. And um, when I started looking at the shapes within the image, um, there are these repeating arches and they're there to our subconscious eye. There's this deeper harmony of connecting circles that she had unwittingly cropped away. But when you go back to the full frame, you know, look at this, it keeps going and these shapes are there and they're not really there, but there's a harmony that starts happening. And the overlapping circles are creating this whole other amazing structure, much like the petals of a flower itself. So the cropped version has none of that. I mean, comparatively, this is a dead and static image. And I wanted to illustrate this to you because um, I think it's really simple, but I think it's a very powerful demonstration of um, what's in an image that we may not really appreciate, you know, at the time that we're shooting it. So here the whole image sings, we're drawn into it. Um, we're interested to look in it, into it more deeply. And again, it's just that two to three ratio image area that naturally makes it happen. The square starts to do all kinds of magic on its own as well. Um, with this shot, I didn't even realize it, but the whole sky is a two to three ratio perfectly. I didn't, I didn't go out there. I mean, these horses were running by really fast and, you know, I was just trying to keep it, keep it in the square and without trying very hard or by accident, really, um, it turned out to be a two to three ratio just because it felt good, you know? And I think when we try to get images um, in frame and we're honoring that frame, these things are just naturally gonna happen. Um, this was that same day and the horizon line is tilted down. But when I straightened it, the whole thing just, and I should put a, uh, an example of that in there, but when I straightened it, the whole image just died. I don't know why, it was just, um, it did not seem right. And when I went back and looked at it, I think the secret to this image is that cloud shape. It's making a divine circle within the square. And being tilted, it had this sort of energy, this counter, I mean, this clockwise kind of motion energy to it. And um, it just felt right. At the time, I didn't really realize what was happening, but after you go back and start looking at, at shapes, um, I think we're seeing things subconsciously um, 
you know, for me, I was just trying to get the tension of that cloud, the top of that cloud in the frame, just to the edge. Um, and everything else just sort of happened. So when we, when we fill our given frame with these wonderful shapes from nature, um, all of this stuff starts to happen. I mean, this is from um, our Golden Isles workshop, which we're going to do in November this year. I had, we were going to do it in April, but it's, that's totally not happening. So I'm hopeful that we can go back in November this year, but um, we get to do exercises with all these wonderful tree shapes. And what I ask everyone to do is just be very conscious of what they're letting into the image as well as everything that they are composing out of that given area. In this case, the, the trees become another frame for our little subjects, but the subjects are not really um, that prominent. They're just part of the overall composition. Then I have this weird thing with clouds where the clouds start really almost um, playing a joke on me. They start to mimic what's below. And of course, at the time, I never noticed this, but when I go back and look, and these are, these are not retouched. Um, the effects or settings I made up in camera. So the effects being made as I'm shooting it. Um, in the first one, these clouds start having the same exact shapes as the landscape. And then in this one, this is totally freaky, but this cloud here, it starts to turn into this food dog statue over here. It's, you know, the same kind of creature as this. So that was kind of spooky. But I, I really depend on clouds. Clouds are the power of clouds. They are the most important thing. And if I see a solid blue sky, I just want to crop it out. Maybe I don't even have a horizon line because um, there's something about those changing shapes that when I see a cloud, I just run for my camera. So these ideas about composing in camera and how we subdivide our frame into these shapes in the moment, you know, when we're taking, when we're taking the photograph. Um, I wrote more about it. And if you want to go back and read more at a later date, it's at um, robindavis.com. And if you click on blog, there are several articles about our intention. Writing about this has helped keep me on track with my own intention. And I realized that we have this powerful creative energy that, that totally gets turned up when, when we start using our cameras this way. And it's almost as if our camera is a, I would call it like a divining rod so that we're actually being led to find the kind of images that really excite us. So that's why I keep saying, if you tonight even wanna make some notes and write this down, um, these, are the, these are the building blocks that let you be your own creative director. Another big thing in our series that, that unites it is your tonality. I have been really into these colors lately. Um, the tonality of our image is what makes us unique, what makes us um, individuals. And I think that our viewers want to see our unique persona come through our photos. So um, I'm trying to be very consistent with the tones and the shapes. And, you know, the theme, well, this, this actually was an exhibition. These were canvases, canvas prints, then they were hung in this grid pattern. And in the show, it was, it was up at um, PB&J Gallery, I think a couple, two years ago. Um, the idea was that each photograph in this series has a matching counterpart. There's something in each image 
that matches one of the other images. So uh, people had fun trying to, trying to figure it out. Um, and that was sort of the, the premise for my series, but really the real uniting principle of the whole thing were, were the colors. There's no other, um, you know, there's no red, there's no warm, um, real, you know, reality kind of colors in there, but yet there is color, you know, it's not a monochromatic, it's monochromatic, but it's not colorless, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Robin, before you go further, uh, would you give us a hint as to any two of those that, that uh, are connected? Yeah, does anybody want to guess? You have to unmute yourself if you're going to guess. I see in the second and third one arches, an arch. Yes, ding, 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 ding. I see <laughs> two chairs. Yes, correct. Well, we've got the uh, bottom right and the middle left end with folks in very, um, very formal attire. Exactly. Trees. Top hat. Twisting. Yeah. Trees. Okay. Top left and middle bottom is trees. Perfect. Various trees. Anybody else? Unmute yourself if you want to jump in. I see a bike on the top left and a bike in the middle right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, ding, yeah. ding, ding. Correct <laughs> again. I told you this was going to be fun. <laughs> yeah. I think y'all got them all. Awesome. Okay, let's let's mute ourselves and keep going, Robin. Thank you. I'm so impressed. You guys were very astute. You were on it. So I'm so glad. When I started getting closer to stuff, um, I wanted to see detail. So I wanted it to be lighter. And the tonality that holds this series together is um, one that I'm going to continue because spring is just about to bust out. And I'm gonna use this kind of tonality um, where I'm doing a lighter exposure to get a pastel look. The other thing that simplifies these are um, losing depth of field. And it's a game on you know how, how close can I get and where do I wanna put the focus? So, um, and, you know, I know you guys totally know what I'm talking about, but I'll just, um, you know, crank the focus as far as it will go. And then I'll just kind of move in and out to try to try to get the, um, the sharpest part exactly where I want it. And that's hard to do, you know, again, when the wind's blowing and stuff is going on, um, I've even taken, taken stuff inside and used, um, window light but that way you know I didn't have to worry about the little flowers blowing around if this is still day it's a lot more fun doing it outside I agree Robin uh, I'll, I'll ask were you shooting those on a tripod or are you hand holding that I was hand holding it and um, they were kind of moving a little bit and I had well, the one on the right was pretty still but the other ones they were kind of blowing around but um, I would just um, crank the focus out to make it, you know, as, as up close as it would go. So I'm not really changing the focus there, but I would just physically move closer and farther back from it, you know, to, and I know y'all have done that. Um, that way I could get as close as possible and um, it was easier for me to make little micro adjustments just by moving myself than the actual focus of the camera. You know what I'm saying? Yes. When um, I started really thinking about light and time of day and all that kind of stuff, um, I, um, I got really interested in infrared and how I could change reality by, um, by using a, a digital camera that I converted to infrared. So these two images were taken on the exact same day in the exact same place 
and with the exact same camera. And the difference is the first one, I intentionally made it high key. I made my exposure as light as possible without losing detail in the sky. And I also lightened it to achieve this, that very airy color of sand and sunlight. So the only thing I really did in post-production was just a little pop of contrast with when I printed it. And then the opposite for the dark one, I intentionally made everything dark. And so I exposed just for the brightest highlights. This was very um, hard, bright morning light. So there was some ugly stuff in the background that I didn't want to see. And guess what? It just got swallowed up and hidden in those full um, dark shadows. So I think that exposure is as our most powerful tool for creative effects, those decisions can, um, you know, and how you expose um, really makes a big difference. Um, here's another one that I intentionally made darker by um, stopping down um, really a stop or even more because um, you couldn't see the detail in the sky and these little spots of light were coming down on the landscape. The landscape itself up close, there was not really anything interesting that I wanted to see anyway. So it was all about the distance in the sky and the dark, the darkest ones were the most dramatic. When um, I was shooting color slide film, um, the Fuji Chrome slide film had these really cool blue and purple and green tonalities. So this was a very, very foggy morning that, um, that was purple. And I saturated a little bit and an interior designer saw it and she says, oh, I'm going to design a purple and green room around this series, you know, do you have any more? And I, I actually did, I, luckily I had a few more with this weird color palette and the scenes were very traditional, but the colors were so unexpected that um, um, it, it really was um, her final, what she did with it, the images that she chose um, really made a, a neat installation. So I think that um, color, again, this is full, you know, bright color, but it's very simplified. All that's really in there is the, the purple and the green. So that was one way that I simplified the image. Um, another way is of taking out what you don't wanna see, simplifying your image and putting the focus exactly where you want it takes out a lot of distraction. Um, Plant forms are one of my favorite things to photograph and it's spring and um, it's already springtime. I'm already starting to see trees bud out like this. So, um, you know, this weekend I'm gonna try to get out and get some more to, to put into this series of um, little um, macro studies. Um, I look for a cloudy day, not a windy day and the, again, you know, using my little macro technique. The, um, the workshops that I, that I have coming up, I'm not going, there's something that are posted that are not gonna happen um, just because of where we are. But I'm really hoping that the first one will be the waterfall workshop I have in North Carolina every August. And there's this wonderful garden, several gardens, but these waterfalls that um, are wonderful, but there's this whole um, little micro macro universe where there's a, a tiny moss garden with little weird mushrooms and all these other tiny strange plants that grow in um, the rainforest. And that whole part of North Carolina is actually considered a, a rainforest. It's got all these, um, these weird little things. Uh, so anyway, I'm hoping we can we can do that in um, late August. I think it's August the 22nd. Um, 
But back to this less depth of field idea, um, the idea that you can take something so tiny and by getting it close, creating that tension, getting it close to the, to the edge, it, it kind of becomes monumental or even scary. I mean, there's something kind of scary about that, you know? What, what is gonna, it's, yeah, it's a flower, it's pretty, but then there's this tension of, of what's gonna bust out, you know? Um, so looking for those kind of forms is another series that I'm gonna continue to work on. I intentionally back focused this because the pretty part was in the back of the image. Normally I, I, I focus on, you know, like, like these, I'm focusing on what's closest to me and letting everything else go away back into the distance. But here there were these ugly scraggly weeds in the front that was a real mood killer. So I had this whole thing about avoiding um, ugly foliage. And if, I know you've probably heard this from me before, but one of the things that I despise the most in photography is offensive shrubbery. And I will tell you now, that is the one thing that, um, that I fight, you know, it's, it's always there. And, you know, you'll, you'll be looking into the distance and in your frame, you'll later find these little bushes and things that you didn't want, or you'll have just a, a foreground, you'll have unattractive plants in the foreground that detract from your shot. And, you know, the real subject, the interesting part of this image was the road going back. So I, um, you know, was shooting with my aperture wide open to try to get the foreground to drop out to lose that depth of field. You know, you can also go back and, and blur it if you want to and create that same illusion. Here's another one. This is an Italian duck at late twilight. And again, those cool monochromatic blues are just naturally appearing. Um, but again, there were these ugly bushes in the foreground that I couldn't, you know, I couldn't get out there and um, get beyond them. So I just blurred them out. And in a way, I think it kind of adds to the abstraction here. So remember the intentionally blurred foreground or background if you wanna hide ugly clutter. Um, I think with bird photography, the hardest thing was um, controlling your background. You would have this beautiful bird, but then your background would just not be romantic. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of these are tricks to um, get your camera to show what you want and obscure what you don't want. I'm always consciously cropping out any tree limbs, twigs, um, getting just to the most simple of the simple thing here. You know, the water reflection melded with the rippled texture of the surface of the water. Um, the only real reality here are these little floating leaves, you know, that's sort of the, the little touch of reality, but everything else is just this dreamlike um, symbolism. One of the hardest projects I ever did, and I applied for this as a grant, so I had to do it um, after it, it got really hard. Um, I had this idea to photograph birds in nature and then do these um, abstract patterns. So basically it's two shots. The abstract one is cut apart and then the, the bird is in the middle and they would have matching tonalities and they would be printed on silk. Well, I did not decide to print these images on silk as an afterthought. I knew up front that I wanted these watery airy patterns and colors. And um, you'll see also in, in the next one, um, 
I had to control the background. So in these, I used a, you know, one of the cheap mirror lenses. It was, you know, I had to really practice. It was hard to get it exactly sharp because, you know, you're having to, to focus it. But the thing that it did for me is it dropped out the background. In reality, this background was, was not pretty. It was um, mud and sticks that were not attractive. And that was sort of the trick, a really good trick um, to make it pretty and painterly. And at the same time that I did the view of the bird flying through the swamp, um, I would tilt my camera down and get these groovy reflections in the water. So both of them were created at the same time, the same place, the same tonalities. Um, and then the other thing, cause I had to make it really hard, you know, I had to, I had to suffer uh, to make it as difficult as possible. So then I had to actually find fabric that had those same colors and then sew them into these, um, you know, these tall um, fabric tapestries. Um, and I did, I started out trying to sew them myself and that didn't last very long at that point. I had, I had to get help and I had a um, professional um, costume designer helped me finish them in time so I didn't, um, um, mess up my grant. So I guess the whole point of showing you those and the other ones that were on silk before, um, if you know that you want to try printing on something else, I've printed on glass and wood, tile, mirror, metal, fabric, as well as um, watercolor paper, canvas. And when you know ahead of time, you can make decisions with your exposure and also design it to the shapes of the different materials while you're shooting it. And that's how you know your final prints are really gonna look great because you're making that decision up front. Um, if you guys have any questions, if you're thinking about some alternative printing surfaces, um, you know, I've, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that I, that I don't know about, but I have tried a lot of these and um, I would be happy to tell you what I've, what I've learned the hard way. I had this really cool lens, uh, old lens that I forgot that I had. It was an old, um, really worthless zoom lens. But if I could get just the certain way, I could get a reflection where the surface pattern of the water and the reflection in the water would meld into this one panel like stained glass and if you didn't have the right angle or if the light I mean you, you had to do it at uh, midday and I figured out some other rules but um, it really turned into this cool series and these are all full frame I haven't done any retouching maybe I increased the contrast a little bit when I when I printed them on other surfaces but um it's just the, the, the lens is doing it, you know? Um, and with adapters, you can put any lens on any other camera, even if the lens are two different brands. You could put a, you know, a Nikon on a Canon. Uh, you can mix and match to, to meet your, your needs. And um, I have a great friend, um, Larry Hoyt, who's experimented with old lenses and he can actually retrofit them onto his new Sony camera body. Um, and at our photo party on Saturday, he's going to show us some of the effects of these old lenses. Some of them are old antique view camera lenses. Some of them are um, 
movie lenses and you have to manually set your exposure and, and uh, f-stop and all that but you can get these real painterly effects with your lenses so yes definitely lenses are like paintbrushes to the artist and this entire show came from a ditch full of muddy swamp water in south georgia you know um I, I, when I went, the day that I went to shoot that, I was not expecting this to happen when I discovered that um, there was this point of combination where the water and reflection melded. I was just, um, I felt totally euphoric. I was skipping around and, you know, that, that day I got the whole show and the show was up at um, Mason Fine Art and then it, um, PB and J, and then it was up at 12 in Virginia Highland. And um, again, this is this really excites me. I mean, I want to go, I want to go out and do more of these. Again, here, um, this is printed big on canvas, and people have thought that it was a painting because of how the, the shape, you know, the water. Yes, and there's there's the waterfall motion, but then there was this um, articulation that looks very brush like. And um, I've tried to do this before. Sometimes I can do it, and sometimes I can't get it to do that. You know, it's uh, lots of trying. And the other thing I've done is when I try different things, I I write it all down. Um, the thoughts of what I was trying to do, you know, whether it, whether it worked or not. And that's really helped me. And even writing down what didn't work helps me because it's like, ooh, that didn't work. Don't do that again, you know. But um, the, the being in the moment, I think, is, um, is what makes us artists with our camera. Um, this was an idea I had as a homage to nature um like she's this um nature goddess i called it the opening of spring and this is the in camera right out of the camera file this is 100 percent unretouched again straight from the camera i shot this in my neighbor's yard and the globy effect and the dark exposure is all done in camera so again, I'm using natural light, exposing for the highlights, letting the shadows go dark, um, hiding offensive shrubbery. And the next one I'm going to show you is the retouched version. This is after I went in and made my changes for the final image. That's the final shot. And, you know, I couldn't model direct the moth. So I had to add that in post production. And then I plugged up some of the parts that I didn't like. So this is the original, the retouched, the original, the retouched. So, you know, through these holes, you could actually see into the street. And I think partly you could see part of my neighbor's car. I mean, there was stuff there that I couldn't change, you know. I mean, I guess I could have gone and put a backdrop back there, but, you know, it's totally unnecessary. But I think that when you, when you start to, um, to think about the powers that you have in the moment, it becomes, photography for me becomes a lot more fun. Another thing I, I work, I'll look out for is um, killing the mood of a photograph by too much sharpening and saturation. A photograph can have a softness and still be sharp. And I'm very, very protective 
of my horizon line. A lot of times if I add any kind of filter over it, I get this um, hard white halo outline from um, over sharpening between the sky and the horizon, or you'll see that white outline over a mountainscape. And when, when you're doing post-production, it's really worth it to go in and lasso those really delicate transition points of the, of the far horizon of where the sea meets the sky, where the mountain meets the sky and protect that from being over sharpened because um, in painting, they call it atmospheric perspective. As, as things get farther away, they get softer, they get cooler, they get lighter, you know, because they're far away. If, if they're too saturated or they're too sharp, then they come flying up onto the front plane of the image and it, it loses um, that atmos atmospheric perspective, you know? Um, when I, well, I'm gonna show you something horrible next. Um, I just, I went and found an image and I oversaturated and I over sharpened it to the maximum position. And you'll see that, of course, this is really overdone, but you can see just from sharpening it, how that artifact appears on the horizon. I don't, I don't know why it does that, but um, I'm really, I really guard that. Um, the other thing with digital is there's this brassy grass green color that I try to avoid. And then again here, the most horrendous thing of all is the offensive shrubbery right here up front. And it's detracting, you know, it's, it's, um, photo bombing the entire image, that and the sky over here. Um, the shot that I got there that I did like, um, you know, even that, I'm, I'm just making sure I don't have that outline. The green is more subdued, you know, and I have a whole series of Tuscany landscapes that have this jewel tone, um, rich colors like Florentine paper, um, you know, that, that connects them. It's very colorful, but it's still subdued just a little bit, you know. Um, what, I'm, what I'm really getting at is, um, the, the control, you know, that we can do all this. Yes, we can go out, we can see wonderful things happen in nature and, and we can capture them, but we can also make them happen. You know, I think if you go out with the intention that you're gonna get a really, really great shot, you know, if you imagine it in your mind, um, I think you walk around the corner and you find just what you're looking for. You know, there's, uh, there's something to be said for setting your intention and starting with an idea, this is um, an overview, condensed overview of the points that I wanted to make for you guys. Um, if I had to boil it all down and I can, I can, it's not that long, I can read it to you, but if you want, I can just email it and you guys can read it at your leisure after you've had time to, to think about it. Um, yeah, Robin, if you'll send it to me, I'll just send it out as an attachment to everyone who's on the, uh, on the Zoom meeting. Yeah, let's do that, because that would be kind of anticlimactic to, <laughs> to read it all right now, but it does boil down all of my points from tonight. And, um, you know, if you start with an idea, the rest will come. Um, at the end, I talk about how you're going to print and exhibit your work, but a lot of the work I'm doing now with my students, I'm doing one-on-one -on -one online sessions about creating their website galleries and also beautiful books. Um, so it does not have to be the, you know, traditional 
framed show um, that I'm talking about here. But, um, you know, when, I, when I'm looking at our work, when we're talking about our work together, um, I think we're all looking for that creative spark of, of individuality. And there are photos that only you alone can make. And those are the photos that give us that really deep feeling of satisfaction. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and they're photos that you can take and I could try forever and I would never be able to take it, even if I had the same camera lens, camera settings and all that. And it's because you're, you know, you're, you're pulling your persona through the camera, you know, you're making your images and that's, that's what I want us to do. That's, that's really my, my goal in my photography and for you guys. So I'm uh, totally happy to answer any questions or take suggestions. Yes. Um, anyone, you'll need to unmute yourself if you've got a comment or a thought or a question, go ahead. Um, what equipment are you shooting with? And these, uh, a lot of different stuff. Um, some of it is a, um, a Fuji X-T1. Some of it is um, slide film, um, other different digital cameras. The um, infrared ones were a... Um, Canon digital camera that I had um, sent away and they switched the sensor out for infrared. Um, some of them are with my, my iPhone. But if you have a specific image, um, like this one was the Fuji X-T1. digital camera and there are settings where you can go in and make it glowy. You know, the other thing I've done too is um, actually put an old um, glow filter on the digital camera and, you know, put the effect in right then when I was shooting, I didn't go back. And what, what I found personally is if I went back and tried to add a glowy effect in Photoshop, um, I got too heavy handed with it and it didn't, it wasn't like it was embedded in the image. It was like, it was a, almost like a curtain over the image, if that makes any sense. And doing it um, with the camera setting or putting a physical filter on the end of the lens, you know, over the lens, like, you know, we did in the old days, um, had a much more organic feel to me. Um, and part of it, because it's like, I wasn't doing it. I, I think a lot of times with, um, with the, any kind of ap after cropping or uh, post-production, um, I would find I would get too heavy handed with it, if that makes any sense. And, um, the ones where the camera was doing it, even though I was, I was controlling it because I was making the camera do it, it seemed to work out a little bit better, if that makes any sense. But if, listen, if there's a specific shot that you want me to go back to, I'll tell you what I used. No, that's, that's fine, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else, any other questions? Hey, Robin, this is Tom. I've uh, started doing more black and white lately myself. I'm assuming that you are doing a lot of digital conversion to black and white, color to black and white. And what are you, are you using, Nick, Photoshop, or how are you doing your conversions? Um, Photoshop and um, the, the other thing I found is um, if I just, if well, if Photoshop does it, there's still different things I can do, or e even if it's camera, camera raw, 
I can make some, you know, decisions there as well. But um, I've not been one to just do any kind of batch conversions because um, everyone will have something different about it. Um, so I do everything one by one and I look at the other images in the series as a sort of my test to keep the highlights and um, you know, shadows so that, that there's some consistency from one image to the next. I'll have one that's, that's like my, um, you know, um, hallmark of it's gotta, it's gotta match this, it's gotta go with that. And I just work on each one, one by one. And sometimes it, it'll, I'll do a conversion in, in Photoshop and it won't look right and I'll do some other kind of thing, you know, it's, it's like you kind of um, have to create a whole new set of rules for each image. I don't know if you've had that experience or not. It's hard to set a template that works for every image. It looks different. Uh, this is a really, really beautiful presentation. I enjoy this very much. Uh, oh, thank you. I could ask one more quick question. The uh, printing that you're doing, I assume you're doing all your own printing? Some of it I am. Um, some of it I um, have used um, John Dean with Dean Imaging. If I have really big, big ones, um, the big bird pieces on silk, um, he printed those. And I've also worked with um, Color Chrome. The, the pieces on tile, and I should have put that in there. Um, I've been really happy with that, but I have to send it to this place in California. I can, if anybody wants to print on tile, you know, you could, you could have a whole, uh, tile photo exhibition in your shower. <laughs> you know? Um, but that's been, um, they've been really good. But what I did was I made a print on my Epson printer and I made it exactly like I wanted to look. And I sent to them, I said, please, you know, get as close to this as you can. This is what, you know, I want the image to look like. So anytime I'm having somebody else print stuff, if I can make a little guide for them to go by, then I've been much happier with the result um, later on. The, the tile ones, they're actually printing a um, decal and it's, um, there's a you know, ceramic and uh, porcelain and they, then they fire the, the decal onto the tile. So it's very permanent. There's some versions where it's not permanent, but this one, um, you can leave it outside for 500 years and it's not supposed to deteriorate. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> well, be, be, be careful with people that promised anything more than 100 years because they know you can't catch them. <laughs> well said. Very well said. Gail, did you have a question? No, you know, I'm, I'm glad Tom asked the question about printing. I'm really interested in the printing on silk. I think that's such a beautiful idea, and especially with, with your artwork, Robin. I just, you know, a great presentation. I really, really enjoyed it. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Will anybody see shrubbery without thinking of it being, thinking of it being offensive in the future? I wrote anyway. down offensive shrubbery. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. It's true. It's out to get me. Aqua avia, those those bird prints, uh, just absolutely beautiful. And and the composition of that was that really piqued my interest to do something like that. I, I I've not not tried to combine, you know, two things from the same location that were so same and yet different and that yeah yeah that just that's really interesting to me i'm gonna i'm gonna do a little something with that i'm not sure what yet but well i would love to see what you guys come up with um you know for, for me my inspiration was um these um japanese or um some of them were, were from china they were scroll paintings from the 
the 1500s, but they looked very, very modern. You know, they had this kind of simplicity and they were, um, you know, paper, they were scrolls and then you would hang it from, from the top. So it was sort of that, that proportion and the hangers that I got, these wooden carved hangers um, were actually even carved where they had little um, flourishes on the end like um, clouds and waves that also went back to the, you know, to the subject matter Beautiful. Of, um, of what I was trying to do. But um, it really was the hardest thing I ever did because the birds were terrible. I mean, they <laughs> would not cooperate and... <laughs> I was just, you know, and at this point I was shooting slide film. So I had a, I mean, I went through so much film. Oh my gosh. Um, it was terrible. But the, the, the real dramatic thing that happened was um, I was down on the coast and I was sort of going on these back roads and I was by myself and there was this wonderful, almost, um, you know, Zen looking background of all these beautiful trees and the birds were coming in to, to light on the tree. And I was just like, okay, this is it. This is, this is my moment. And I looked and there was this wonderful hard packed area down, dropping down from the road. So I got my tripod set, set up for the tree and I'm lying there on this wonderful hard packed, you know, it was like, it was just meant it was right there. It was meant to be. So I'm lying there waiting for these birds and I hear, you know, I can hear these tires and I look up on the road above me and there's this man in a golf cart with like five or six dogs in the golf cart. And I'm just like, get out of here. They're going to ruin my, my shot. Get those dogs out of here, you know? And he goes, Hey, what you doing down there? And I said, go away, I'm trying to photograph these birds. And he said, well, I thought you might like to know you're lying in old Joe's bed and he usually comes home about this time of night. And I was laying in an alligator bed. Ooh. So I was Ooh. saved. I was saved by that man. I mean, if he had not come by, I cannot imagine. So I got out of there real quick. Somebody else would have been presenting tonight, it sounds like. Yes. <laughs> My goodness. Robert, Robert, do you have a favorite place to shoot? A what? A favorite place to shoot? Where do you like to go to shoot? Anywhere I special? love to go to the places that I go back to that are the places that we have our workshops together. And that's the Languedoc south of France. It's um, very, very beautiful, very natural, very natural um, region. And then um, Cortona, that's in the Tuscany region of Italy. And I've been there so much, I know where to go, what the light's gonna be like. Um, so we've had really, really good luck. I showed you some of those places, I think, in, um, in, our, in the slideshow. Um, the waterfall garden area in North Carolina, the, and these are the places I go every, I didn't go last year or this year, of course, but um, those are the places I go every year. And then of course, you know, the, the coast, coastal Georgia, um, around Jekyll, St. Simons, I've found these wonderful little places that, um, you know, you just, you can't take a bad photograph, you know, and you guys have been there, you know what it's like. Um, but I found since I've been, um, I've been homebound, um, some of the coolest photographs I've seen are, are right here, you know, it's just um, getting your mind wrapped around, um, you know, what, what you're doing compositionally. And I could go out and find these little tiny, really cool compositions um, right outside my door. And you guys can too. And I think with the spring, as all these little nature forms start to open up, um, I'm going to be out there. 